Let's uh, have a word of prayer together. Thank you for the cooling rain last night, Lord, and thank you for the rain, the cooling rain of your spirit in our lives, and in the opportunity to study your word, and may your word come alive to us this morning. Amen. Okay, so the handout, of course, has uh, you know, the first couple pages are some general stuff about homosexuality in the Bible, which you can look at on your own. And last week we were looking at the Sodom and Gomorrah story, right, which is in Genesis 18, Genesis 19. Uh, but we didn't get to the kind of a parallel text, which is in Judges 19. So that's going to be on the second page, front of your handout, in the front of that. And it goes over onto the back as well. So um, I want to give you the chance to read this passage. We broke into some groups last week, do the same thing today. So um, again, the second page of the handout, front and back, has Judges 19, 18 and 19. There you go, that one. Thank you. And uh, to take a few moments to read through it and chat with your neighbor about it. It's an interesting passage, to say the least, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of work with that a little bit in terms of uh, understanding the Sodom and Gomorrah passage a little bit. And you, you, can, you can look at it in your Bible as well, if you want. Okay, so, reflections, observations, questions. I've never taken my concubine to Gabea. <laughs> Certain places you don't want to go, right? <laughs> okay. It's actually a really good observation. We'll, we'll talk about what Gibeah or Gibeah say, said, it's kind of said both ways. Yeah. But what you've observed is the co one part of the context, right? And uh, I, I should have had, this is my mantra for this class. So we get to say this together. Every text has a context, okay, um, to try to understand what's going on. Other observations, questions? Yeah? My observation is that um, the men in the town seem to be kind of deviants. Why would they knock on their neighbor door and why? They don't know this man and want to do some deviant behavior. Okay, yeah. So I'm, I feel that that's so inappropriate, but yet it is the patriarch. The patriarchy says that, hey, I won't let you mutilate my guests, yet I'm also going to give you my daughter or a concubine. Okay, so, yeah, yep. There was no respect for women. Women had no power. So it was really pretty gross and sad. Yeah. Those were some mean-spirited men. <laughs> okay. It's another really good observation, and I'm going to... Uh, it's not in the handout, but if you have a, a Bible open, I'm going to refer you to the very first verse of chapter 19. Um, so that's on 284 in the Good News, and if you have another version. Somebody want to read the, uh, the first part of that verse? In those days before Israel had a king? Yes, and in my version has, in those days when there was no king in Israel. So that is... You know, sort of the opening statement, and which is actually a refrain that you will find throughout the book of Judges. So Judges is sort of this lawless period in some ways. Um, there's no centralized authority or government. We have 12 tribes, right? And uh, the story goes on to talk about the Benjaminites, right? Tribe of Benjamin. And, uh, you know, the 11 tribes go to war against this 12th tribe because of what's happened. In, in this story, right? So that, Barbara, that puts some of the context in terms of this kind of behavior. In other words, you know, no holds barred. People are doing strange stuff. Um, anybody know any of the characters in the book of Judges? There's one really famous one. Push, pushes down the walls of the temple and everything's destroyed. Gets his hair cut, yeah. Not his beard. We got, we got a nice beard back there today, right? You know, you know who that is? Samson. Samson, yeah. The story of Samson, which is a really strange story. I mean, if you grow your hair, you get, you know, you're like Popeye, and if you cut it off, you 
you know, or a weakling kind of thing. Something interesting going on there. Book of Judges is filled with stories that seem kind of strange to us. Um, there's some, I can't go into this in great detail, but some say it's a book of satire in terms of kingship. And, and one of the ways to understand, so a context for judges, uh, Israel, or the Israelites, they do evil in the sight of the Lord. The people cry out, and when they do evil, judgment comes upon them, usually by invasion. You know, some outside group, whatever, comes in and takes over. Uh, God raises, they, they cry out to God. God raises up a leader or a judge, and the Spirit of the Lord comes upon that person, that individual. And it isn't just men who are judges. It's actually, have you ever heard of Deborah? Deborah is a judge um, who, in, in, uh, earlier in the book, who is raised up as a leader to help uh, bring about uh, the leader, you know, defeats the enemy and peace is regained. What happens, though, in the book of Judges, it's kind of cycles of this. So it's like over, you know, decades, maybe hundreds of years, where there's no central authority. You have the 12 tribes, and you have this story of Judges 19 that's in this context, okay? And, obviously, can you see the parallels with the Genesis text of Sodom and Gomorrah? terms of this text, right? It's kind of that similar, there's people who, uh, someone comes and hospitality is given and then people, men come and they are wanting to do despicable things to the guests and the host says, no, but you can have my daughter or in this case, the concubine. And if you read it closely, it actually, actually says, you can either have my daughter or the concubine. So this is, the host is kind of a little bit strange there ends up being the concubine who is taken out, ravished, raped. I mean, let's be blunt about it. doesn't say raped in the text, but that's what happens. And murdered, which is a, a further, which doesn't, uh, is not explicit in the Genesis text. All right? And then there's this cutting up stuff. What, what's going on with cutting up her body? Any ideas on that? Besides revulsion, which... Yeah, maybe. So, you know, there's some... Well, and he not only cuts the body up, but then sends it to the, the other tribes, right? And um, if you were to go on, if we had time to look at Judges 20 and 21, it describes those tribes being revulsed by this, coming together, going into battle against their brothers. This is civil war, right? The Benjaminites. Some say this is actually a, a, a story. Of, so King Saul is in the future. Depends on when you think this material is written. But some think that maybe this is about Saul because Saul comes from that tribe. And so it's sort of an anti-Saul, pro-David thing. Just kind of stick that away. At, can't go into that in, in great detail. Um, but, you know... Obviously, getting body parts will get you, um, get you riled up, right? I mean, in terms of going to war. And, uh, and there's some interesting stuff at the end because most of them are killed, and, but they realize they really don't want to kill all the Benjaminites, right? I mean, they're, they're still their brothers. So it's kind of like at the end of the Civil War in the United States, reparations or um, reconstruction, so there's some of that going. I'm just pointing this out to you. You can go and look at that at that text and get a sense uh, of some of the some of that some of those issues. Um, again, pretty gruesome, yeah. You know, in terms of this, both the act that happens and then cutting up the body and that sort of thing. You know, these texts, in terms of their context, um, and goes back to the Sodom and Gomorrah story. Um, it's always about male honor, and it's never about the women in terms of what happens to them. I mean, in fact, there's a, a woman biblical scholar in the 70s. Her name was Phyllis Tribble, and she wrote a, a book titled Texts of Terror. Texts of Terror. 
where she looked at some of these passages where women are treated really, really poorly, and that's not the right word, horribly, right? Horrific. And um, trying to understand them in terms both of the context, but also then to raising the consciousness in terms of feminist biblical hermeneutics or interpretation, understanding these kinds of passages, and how sometimes appealing to these passages, um, they can be used, they can be misused in terms of denigrating women. We're seeing women as second class. Texts of Terror. It's a pretty interesting book if you're, you're interested in that. So, what are we supposed to do with this stuff? And, of course, it does talk about they want to ravage the man first, right? And th which is the connection with the Sodom and Gomorrah story, the connection with homosexuality, right? That this text then is one of those used to say that homosexuality is wrong. The context seems to say there's more going on. Yeah? Yeah, it really seems to be really based on creating fear. You know, you should fear those men who would want to ravage this this visitor. Um, look out for them. We had to give up, you know, concubine, but oh, that was certainly better than giving in to. You know, these men wanted to ravage this. Right. Man. In terms of the male honor, we talked about honor shame last week, right? I mean, a good host protects his his uh, guests, and I'm using his intentionally because. It's the men who are in, in, they have the responsibility. And yeah, you're right. There, there's something here that's, there's this, this broader context. <clears throat> it's certainly, just like the Sodom and Gomorrah story, it does talk about um, men wanting to do despicable things to men, right, in terms of sexuality. Um, but is the text really primarily about sexual ethics? Or is there something else that's going on? Yes? It doesn't sort of have to deal with the stranger in the presence, too. We're going to attack the stranger. We're not attacking the people within the town themselves. Because he's a stranger. Yeah, sure. Town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, an outsider. An outsider. So we're he's going to become the outsider, but we're not going to become the people within the Right. So uh, it's morally less reprehensible to do that to someone from the outside than maybe someone from your own group. Yeah, yeah. I, I think see, there's part of that. I see it uh, without uh, any, uh, what can I say, uh, warfare is what I see as a result of all of this. I see it the only uh, end result if there's no uh, resol resolving this issue, uh, the warfare would have to develop. And should it uh, come from the woman directly or from uh, men, I don't, I don't know who's going to create the warfare but warfare will be an end result of this type of thing. Mm -hmm. And we, as a church, uh, are, uh, of course, we don't encourage warfare. And so for me, it's a big issue. Uh, sure. And it, it involves warfare. And so one of the things, the book of Judges, one of the lessons, so to speak, is that um, when you don't have a king, and, you know, this is a debatable issue within the Israelite community throughout the centuries. But a king's going to bring a, some level of security and perhaps less warfare. And if you look in, my, in, uh, see in chapter 20, in the Good News Bible, it says Israel prepares for war. And then uh, later on, I'm looking at the this, this subtitles. The war against the Benjaminites and how the Israelites won. And then wives for the tribe of Benjamin when they're almost all wiped out. I mean, obviously, what occurs then is and if you look through here, it talks about tens of thousands of people being killed in, the, in this warfare. And that's, that's pretty typical of the book of Judges. So, so, again, the context of Judges, the stuff about sexuality is just a, such a small part of this. And if you're looking at, that, at the handout, okay, and, what, and one of the reasons I've given you this handout is because it has the two columns of interpretation. And there are those, and you know, in terms of our reading, Christian context, who would say, well, the text says it's about you know, men having sex with men, so it's homosexuality, and read in the context of other passages, in terms of, this, of the handout. 
The other column says, you know, more what we're looking at today. And again, my goal is for us to understand that there are differing ways that the text can be read and interpreted. Okay? And one of the things that we are charged with as a church, you know, at coming together, is to adjudicate, in a sense, together. You know, not that one of us necessarily has the right reading, but, you know, which one is more persuasive? And in the context of other passages that we've looked at as well. Anything else on the Judges passage? You want to ask about comments or questions? Looks like one. I want to say something, but I'm not sure what it is. It, it, goes, it goes to, are we evolving as, a, as humanity? And I read this and I go, this is horrible. This is terrible. And um, it's very helpful having this conversation about their context. They're prioritizing hospitality, welcoming. The, the way the story humanizes strangers and the other, um, and then that gives you permission to do whatever it is that you want to do with whomever in any kind of way, however. So, I, you know, I'm repulsed by the way the story goes and locking up people and sending messages via body parts and, and of course, the way women are seen, mm -hmm. whether, mm -hmm. and, and as well as just being a slave. If you're a slave, you get to do anything you want with your property, your, your slave property, or your women property. So move that to today, and where does that take us? And you know, have we evolved in the way women are treated? Well, I'm not property anymore, mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, you places where I miss, you know, sure. so it goes back to the hashtag um, Me Too kind of conversations and, and where does that go? But also the big, the shame context. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if you want a deep-seated cellular sense of, of this concept of shame and honor, and how does that play out today in a contemporary sense and it's still very prevalent, and it still relates to how women are something less, paid less, um, black ceilings that keep you in a certain place, who are not welcomed as pastors in certain congregations. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. just pulled out examples all over the place. And then yeah. some men have to defend their sense of honor. So there's just there's a lot going on. A lot. You're you're and exactly I, right. And I think yeah. that's especially especially true of any Christians who read this and indeed take the interpretation. Wow, look at look at look at how this relates to homosexuality, and forget the other context of here. What about the women? That says a lot about their beliefs. If that's how they what they're reading into this. Well, and that's the the part about the text having a context, and kind of a parallel statement is that. We all, and we all do this, we all come to the text with our own preconceptions or issues that are most important to us. Um, and so, it, and in mentioning, for example, that the book of Judges is about um, there was no king and the people sinned and then God raises up a leader, you know, and the leader, you know, helps them to throw off the foreign oppression. But then it cycles again. It happens again and again and again. That's what Judges is all about. And, then it, and in that way, it becomes then a sort of justification or a plea for, we do need a king. Because the, we'll, we'll keep doing this cycle. We'll keep doing all the things that, you, that uh, you've mentioned in terms of, of women and honor and shame and all those kinds of things. I mean, the issues you raise, they're all, they're all over the text. Not to say that the sex stuff isn't there. It's there, but... It's a lot of other stuff. Yeah. Uh, I just picked up this. It's the NIV study Bible, and it gives the notes down here, and it said, uh, the sexual perversion of these wicked men is yet another example of the decadence of the age. Uh, everyone did as he saw fit. A similar request was made by the men of Sodom, i.e. homosexuality was common among the Canaanites. Okay. And you mentioned those are from the study notes. 
Yeah, it's, yeah. So this is an, an interpreter who's lifting up and using the term homosexuality, which is not in the text. I'm just, and again, I'm just pointing out, um, which for us, you know, in the now 21st century, we often think about it in terms of homosexuality. I mean, one of the things you could argue is that, yes, sexual perversion is part of this text, but it's only one aspect of a whole range of issues that's going on. And whether that then means that this text can be used as a proof text or one to, be, to, to give us guidance in terms of sexual ethics, and this would be, if you're looking at the one column of interpretation, what it would say is, uh, we, need to t we need to look at the context, not just of this judge's passage, but all the passages around sexual issues, um, you know, which we're slowly working our way through. It's interesting, <clears throat> I mean, this judge's passage, how many have ever read judges before? Okay, a few. Um, I mean, it's certainly not a commonly read text, I'll put it that way. But it's just interesting how just the little bit we've done today has generated so many comments and, and ideas and issues for us to think about and to consider, right? Which I think is what really good Bible study is about, right? In terms of helping us look at texts and, and not just pull out a proof text for something that we were concerned about, but to allow the Bible to shape our ethics and our morality and, and such. Yeah? Just a question, just in a general sense, is there any connection between the Judges text and the, and the Genesis passage? I mean, it's like they're almost like parallel stories. Mm -hmm. and it's, I mean, what's, what's going on with that? There's definitely a literary link. In other words, and of course this gets into authorship, in who, you know, who wrote these texts, uh, were they oral and then get, got written down? I mean, there's a lot of, you know, permutations in terms of looking at that kind of stuff. But clearly, you know, one could say, yeah, it looks like these two texts are in conversation with each other. And remember, last week when we looked, and if you missed last week, uh, you know, Paul's taping and that's available, the context we gave for the uh, Sodom and Gomorrah text is that's primarily about the hospitality issue. Remember, we looked at all the passages in the Old Testament, Hebrew Bible, a couple New Testament passages that interpret that the Sodom and Gomorrah story not in terms of sexuality, but in terms of hospitality and how you treat the stranger and the person who's, who, who, who you're hosting and all those kinds of issues, right? So, yeah. And again, when you're looking at this handout, you're, you're seeing there's these two different ways, and there could be other ways, of looking at these issues and these texts. Is it a primarily about sexual ethics? And some argue it is. Or is there a, a, a wider context that it needs to be looked at? Yes? I find it interesting that it's so much about hospitality. And when it came down to the man's daughter or the stranger's <laughs> concubine. Well, um, Sure, and that's went so far. <laughs> right, and that's one of the reasons Phyllis Tribble wrote this book called Texts of Terror. You know, she titled her book that because she says, look, if I read this text, I'm a woman, I'm terrorized by this text, right? How, how women get treated. And um, yeah, so it's a lot broader than, you know, simply, you know, it's, there's all these issues that are involved. What was it, what is there somehow a hidden message here? I'm mean, maybe going too deep here. We help the stranger. The stranger offers his concubine. Is, is there some kind of message here about that there was such a fear and distrust of strangers, and yet look what the stranger was willing to do? Just as the man was hospitable to him. It's kind of like stranger danger, maybe. <laughs> Uh, no, the stranger wasn't so bad after all. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's still a strange story. Yeah, yeah it, you know. And so, and one of the things about strange stories is that we should be careful about the, the implications that we pull out from them. Or in other words, what it tells us how we should live today. You know, and I think our conversation today is a microcosm of that. Because what we're seeing is that this story becomes really, it's, it's complex, first of all. 
Secondly, we should be careful about uh, how we then you know, read that passage and how that should impact our lives and how we should live. Should we treat strangers that way? I mean, clearly our culture today has sees stranger danger everywhere. Many ways, not just the uh, issue in terms of immigrants and that sort of stuff, but you, you mentioned fear, right? Fear is a huge issue in our culture. It's, it's an issue that, it's not that we're all walking around being afraid, but it's an issue that's being used and sometimes abused by our leaders in order to bring, you know, to make decisions, and some of which may not be the best ones, right? I mean, we, our legacy in Colorado, in terms of strangers, part of it is, you know, if you know Governor Ralph Carr, right, during World War II, who said, in terms of the Japanese, right, that that was wrong, what we were putting them into camps. You know, and, and it's a bit of a complex issue. It's always a complex issue in terms of the politics. But he clearly, and is revered by many in the, in the Japanese-American community as someone who said, it's just wrong. You know, what, what we're doing to these folks it shouldn't be happening, for sure. Well, good conversation. Um, boy, this went... I mean, this is really good. Are we, are we all hanging in there in terms of how we're doing? Because um, this is going to go on for a few more weeks. Yes? So, this relates, but it doesn't relate. I had the grandkids. We were having this conversation about lions and how lions catch their food collaboratively and then the males eat first, the women eat next, and then little baby lion kids get whatever's left over. And my granddaughter Annabelle observes, well, that's not very nice. It's not fair. And I also observe that some, sometimes that happens for people as well, in families, and she's like appalled, you know. But there are cultures where the man eats first, the women eat second, the children eat whatever's left over. So you have cultural context mm -hmm. and patriarchy, maleness rules in many, many contexts. It's not true for all animals, it's not true for all humans. But I think it goes back to the same thing of patriarchy, along with hospitality. The men get welcome, the women get used or abused, or, I mean, they're, you know, like the teacups and the goats and the property. So, hospitality means, take my daughters, of course, you know. And there may be a level of, I don't mind that at all, or there may be a level of, Stranger danger. Oops, I'm gonna say it's mm -hmm. okay though mm -hmm. for you to take my daughters. I don't really much like it, but go ahead. It, I'm gonna save myself. So this context yeah. of patriarchy is a big one for me. Well, and you know, one of the obviously we've mentioned this before, the Me Too movement, right? Uh, and you put it in the broader text context of um, feminist kinds of concerns, which is a bad term for some folks, right? Feminism. But, I mean, one of, what, it has, what it has done is it has opened up conversation. I mean, it's an inter interesting that, that your granddaughters, and she's what, seven, eight? Eight. eight yeah. picks, that, picks up that there's something kind of fishy here. There's something not quite right in terms, you know, of that kind of experience. And, see, and this is this I think is really interesting because there are those who read the, the Bible and say, okay, it, it says this, that's what it means, end of story. Others who say, well, we have to take the context into, into consideration and um, just to use your example, patriarchy, which is definitely an, an issue. Um, how does, and, and let's not go back and say, well, the people who lived two, 3,000 years ago were all just, racist or, you know, um, what's the word, uh, uh, in terms of patriarchy, um, you know, that they, that they all saw men and women. In other words, I think that there were women who didn't like what was going on in the culture at that time, and some men too, but probably more women because they were experiencing it. I mean, that's the whole thing about the Me Too movement. 
And so there are those then, in term, and maybe the other column of terms of interpretation is saying, we need to take seriously uh, the insights and the history you know, of, of what patriarchy has done to women. It, we're using that as, as, as an issue. When we're reading biblical texts um, and to interpret carefully, because the conversation that's going on in the church of the brethren in the Mennonite church around these issues has everything to do with that. It's not simply about biblical interpretation, although that's part of it. Um, and we have some disagreements about that, but it has to do with you know, the history of oppression that's occurred in lots of different ways. So maybe to go back to, I think, your, your comment in terms of human beings. Human beings seem, I mean, judges may be, we're more like the book of Judges than we think we are, right? I mean, we seem to not get it, right? And we need to have leaders raised up or God giving us insight or helping us to move beyond some of those kinds of, kinds of issues. Well, we are at time, so we're good.